evening and welcome to Yours for Probably Always, an evening with Janet Somerville. My name is Risha Mandelkorn and I'm delighted to be your host on this beautiful uh, evening at our virtual author event. And before we begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. We are all immigrants and children of immigrants to Canada. We gratefully acknowledge the original caretakers of this land. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And as we share this space, acknowledging Indigenous nations reminds us of our important connection to this land. I am speaking from the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, a covenant between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that calls upon all of us to take no more than we need, to coexist in peace with other nations, and to ensure the continuing sustainability of the land, air, and water. As settlers and newcomers, we have been invited into this treaty of peace, friendship, and respect. And in that spirit, we honor all who came before us, our own ancestors, as well as all the Indigenous caretakers, named and unnamed, recorded and unrecorded. A few de details before we start. Zoom has two options for viewing found at the top right corner of your screen, and you can select either gallery view or speaker view. You may also enable closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. And this event will be recorded as part of Aurora Public Library's archive of author events. So I'm going to begin with some opening questions to get the conversation started. And um, I invite you to submit your questions to the Q&A at any time during our conversation. And we'll get to as many of them as, we're, as possible in our time allotment. Janet Somerville has taught literature for 25 years in Toronto. She served on the Penn Canada Board and is a frequent contributor to the Toronto Star book pages. Since 2015, she has been immersed in Martha Gellhorn's life and words and has had ongoing access to Gellhorn's restricted papers in Boston. Janet is currently working on a book about the correspondence of Morley and Barry Callahan, A Hundred Years of Engagement with Excellence, as well as a YA biography of Martha Gellhorn. Although currently in Toronto, Janet previously lived in Aurora, and she describes Aurora Public Library as the library of my childhood where I became a devoted lifelong reader. Everybody, it can't get any better than that. Thank you, Janet, and welcome this evening. Thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for this absolutely gorgeous book, not only literally, but so beautifully put together. Thank you for writing it. Thank you, Risha, for having me here. I'm delighted to be here in cyberspace with everybody tuning in to hear a little bit about Martha Gellhorn. So to start our conversation, what inspired you to write yours for Probably Always? Well, this, this takes a little bit of telling. It actually began in New Orleans at Faulkner House Books, which is an independent bookshop in New Orleans. And I was talking to the bookseller and asked her to recommend something to me that I probably would never have heard of. And she suggested I read um, what there is to say we have said, which is the correspondence of Eudora Welty and William Maxwell, two great American writers. And it is such a beautiful book. And it's one that you can open to any page and find something beautiful inside. Their friendship was not only a working uh, relationship, but also a loving one. And so I recommend that to anybody. And I thought someday I'd like to write a book like that. So. I was tweeting about that book of correspondence and a bookseller in Fife, Scotland uh, wrote to me and said, well, have you read the selected letters of Martha Gellhorn? And this, this was in April, 2015, and I had not. So I read those and then I read everything I could get that Martha wrote, everything that was written about her and published, I read and I thought, I'm I'd like to write a novel about Martha Gellhorn. There's never been a novel written about Martha Gellhorn. And then Paula McLean, uh, New York Times bestselling novelist, Paula McLean, who wrote The Paris Wife, um, among others, which is about Hadley Hemingway, Ernest's first wife, announced that she was writing a book about Martha and Ernest, a novel about Martha and Ernest. And so then I, I had to figure out something else to do. So because I knew a publisher would not 
want to buy another novel about Martha Gellhorn when Paul McLean was writing one. So long story short, I ended up um, getting the contact information and maybe Lucy, if you could put up uh, that first slide of the English heritage blue plaque and um, Sandy Matthews in that photo, that's it. Um, and he's holding a photo of Martha there. And Sandy is Martha's stepson, and he is also her literary executor, which means in order to get access to Martha Gellhorn's papers, you need to have Sandy Matthews' permission for access. So by luck, I met Adam Hothschild, who is a great American journalist and writer. He wrote um, Spain in our hearts, which was about the volunteer brigades during the Spanish Civil War. And in that book, um, he talks about Martha and he thanks Sandy Matthews for access to her papers. So by my chance meeting with Adam Hosschild at uh, Toronto's International Festival of Authors, he gave me Sandy's contact information and I wrote to Sandy and obviously he gave me access to Martha's papers in Boston and um, that's how I began to research the book that, that Risha, you were just holding there, yours for probably always. And that blue plaque, that English heritage blue plaque, it's the first time any war correspondent um, was honored with that. So uh, especially fine for Martha B to be the first since that's really what she's known for is her war correspondence. And that's how she made a name for herself. So it's, it's so interesting to look at the past through what are basically two prisms, a recollection of the past and a reflective lens of today. Can you place us in Martha Gellhorn's time period with regard to women's rights and the challenges that she faced? Well, sure. I mean, she's, she's also specifically connected to that because her mother was one of the founding members of the League of Women Voters. Edna Gellhorn. And, and um, there's that photo from 1916, Lucy, if you wouldn't mind just showing that now too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the next one, you can see Martha's there in the front row with her mother standing to her, to your left, if you're looking at it to the left. And Martha's Hope got the balloon in front of her mother there. And Edna was essential in that organization. And it's something that she worked with Eleanor Roosevelt on as well. And when Martha was making her way in the world as a professional person, because she was the only daughter and she had three brothers, her parents were very progressive people in St. Louis at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. And she was raised to believe that she could do whatever her brothers did and it never occurred to her not to follow what she was interested in doing and she also had a very strong personality um, something that stayed with her her long life she died when she was 89 and it was probably just as indefatigable then as she was when she was beginning um, her life as uh, as a correspondent. Now, before she became a war correspondent in 37 during the Spanish Civil War, she actually um, worked for the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, reporting on the treatment of the unemployed um, along the East Coast in the United States. And she was outraged by, by all of that. And she, and in fact, um, a few months into that work, in addition to filing all of these long reports to Harry Hopkins, who was her boss and who was Franklin Roosevelt's right-hand man, she um, was working with a group of people in Idaho and she actually started a riot among the unemployed in Idaho when she suggested they should throw a brick to relief office window to get the attention of the authorities. And then the FBI got involved and said, who is your leader? And they said the relief lady, meaning Martha. And so she ended up getting fired 
from that work. But being fired from that work wasn't much of a deterrent because the Roosevelt's invited her to live in the White House. This is in 1935 for a couple of months until she sorted herself out because they knew having been fired, she would not be able to get a new job in government. So that's, that's where her sort of social justice work began. And um, it, it really never occurred to her not to do what she wanted to do, not to make her what she called her little squeaking noise about the wrongness of things, something that she did her entire life. It really strikes me, we're, we're talking about a woman who was ahead of her time, and yet really of our time right now, you could be talking about an yeah. activist, you know, in 2023, someone making a difference, could you not? Absolutely. And so many of the things she wrote and so many of the things she said are timeless and, and, and even timely. You know, one of the things she said, it's a citizen's job to make a fuss, to complain, to protest. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And you know, she, she knew that democracy was not a noun. It was something everybody citizens were responsible to safeguard it to do the work of of um maintaining it and and we see this as you know shocking as it is in 2023 to see fascism fascism rise up around us uncontested in parts of the democratic world i mean it's she, she would be so appalled that this was happening again, something that she saw in her lifetime in 19, in the 1930s, you know, for, as early as 33, she was calling out Nazis when she covered the London Economic Conference in, in 1933, and she met Hitler's translator and called him out on this, this behavior. And so much of her correspondence in the 30s is, is about that and, and worrying about the rise of fascism and the war that it's, that it's going to surely lead to. So starting with the Spanish Civil War, Gellhorn was the first woman war correspondent to be accredited, and she covered every major war through six decades in journalism. And she's been described as the greatest war correspondent who ever lived. From your perspective, what was the most intriguing period of history that she covered? Oh, I don't even, I mean, because when I was decided how I was going to frame this book, I had to decide what to leave out. There's so much material that didn't make it to the final cut of the book. And because I decided I was going to and essentially in 49, when she adopts an Italian orphan, you know, I, I have to leave out her work with uh, in the Vietnam War. And um, she, you know, I don't know, because, you know, she's most famous for D-Day, for her coverage of D-Day. And for people who don't know the story of Martha and D-Day in June 1944. I, I have to take it back to May 1944. Martha had been reporting, and, and Martha had been reporting on the Second World War since December 1939 for Collier's Magazine. And um, she'd been bothering Ernest to come with her. She, she knew he'd served in the ambulance brigade in the First World War. She had been with him in Spain in 37 and 38 and saw how great he was there. And she wanted him to come to the front. And eventually he gave in, in May of 44, after she'd been doing it for five years. And he took her accreditation papers. So this is the story. Each magazine could only send one accredited journalist to the front. And so for those five years, Martha Gellhorn had been the accredited journalist for Collier's Magazine, a magazine, a weekly that had a readership of 3 million people. That's where she published her first piece of war correspondence, Only the Shell's Wine from Madrid in, in spring of 1937. And Ernest said, okay, 
uh, I'm going to come, but I'm, you know, I, I'm going to go to New York and I'm, I'm going to meet with your editor, Colliers, and see what he can do. So she, he actually stole Martha's accreditation. And um, not only did he steal Martha's accreditation, Martha arranged for him to get a flight to the UK, a flight that was arranged by Roald Dahl, who is in the news recently because the um, publisher who owns the rights to his work now is now doing revisionist uh, work of Roald Dahl's children's books. But Roald Dahl was an attache, British attache in Washington at the time, and he arranged for Ernest to fly with him to London. Martha said, get me a seat on the plane. You took my papers, at least get me a seat on the plane. And Ernest refused to let her get on the plane with him. And so she ended up getting on a Norwegian's munition ship, 44 men, one woman, Martha, um, sailing to Liverpool um, to get there at, at the end of May, only to find out that her husband had been in a car crash after a party at Robert Kappa's and was in a London clinic. This is all to say, Martha, there are always obstacles in Martha's way and none of it mattered because she always found a way to do what she thought was right, to get the story, to go on the record and, and cover what was, what was happening. So she actually, to cover D-Day, hit herself on a Red Cross hospital ship. She locked herself in the toilet until the ship was underway. And she not only did that, but she helped the medics um, retrieve the wounded from the beaches of Normandy. She's the only correspondent and the only woman to be on the beaches of Normandy um, in the days following June 6, 1944. So just truly intrepid, extraordinary. And then she wrote about it, you know? So what's it like to be so connected to a famous person that you've never actually met? Yeah. Um, you like her, you definitely like her, you can tell that. Yeah. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to meet at dinner, what would you ask her? I think I would be probably um, intimidated by her. She suffered no fools. At least we both drink scotch. So I think I probably would, you know, would have to have had, you know, a neat shot of scotch before I sat down with Martha. But what most fascinates me about her is it, it, she, you know, basically what I've been saying, she just did what she wanted to do. She was pioneering in that regard. She didn't care what anybody else thought. You know, she didn't care. And, and I think that's a triumph, especially for a woman, it's even young women today, to have the confidence that Martha Gellhorn had. It's a, it's a real lesson in, in how to be in the world. And also, it was never about her. You know, it wasn't self-reflexive. It, it was about getting the story and telling the stories of, of people who are often the most disenfranchised people, you know, and she always spoke out, wrote about uh, the most disenfranchised uh, among us. So Martha Gellhorn lived within the orbit of a wide cadre of political and celebrity friends, including Ingrid Bergman, Norman yeah. Bethune, Charlie Chaplin, Chiang Kai-shek. Um, you mentioned yeah. Eleanor and Franklin D. Yes. Roosevelt. Of course, Ernest Hemingway, which, which I find the most interesting. People who made history in her time and beyond. What was it in Martha Gellhorn's personality that that situated her in the lives of so many historic people? Well, I think one of the things about Martha too is that she didn't care about celebrity. You know, she was unimpressed by celebrity. And so when her life pushed up against these sorts of figures, they, they were just like anybody else as far as she was concerned. And 
So, you know, the way she met some of these people, too, was just by happenstance. So, yes, she worked for the Federal Emergency Relief Administration with, you know, and got to know the Roosevelts for doing that. And she would have dinner at the White House. Now, the White House then was much more relaxed than than it is in 2023 for obvious reasons. But um, so, for example, she met H.G. Wells there in 1935, because he was there as a guest of the Roosevelt's, just, you know, as famous people coming to America were guests of the Roosevelt's, and and they became friends, and he ended up with a huge crush on her. A lot of the letters that H.G. Wells wrote to Martha are, are romantic letters, um, which she never really understood. He was significantly older than, than she was, but he was also probably the most famous writer in the English speaking world in 1935. And there's Martha Gellhorn who has published at that point, one novel, her debut novel was published in 1934, What Mad Pursuit. And she was working on this book uh, about the treatment of the unemployed that would then be published in 1936 called The Trouble I've Seen. And H.G. Wells acted as her agent and got her a book deal for this. I mean, it's insane, right? But she it's because she just happened to meet him at the White House. And an earlier part of her life, she actually acted as an extra in Hollywood movies in 1932. That all ended up on the cutting room floor, but she met Hollywood people then. H.G. Wells was friends with Charlie Chaplin. He was staying with Martha at one point when she was in the States around this time when she was working on The Trouble I've Seen. And she got bored with him. She said, you know, he'd get up in the morning and he'd start talking about the Ice Age. And then he'd finish by en ending up talking about Henry James in the evening. And, and she just wanted to get write her book. And so she wired Charlie Chaplin and said, invite Wells out to stay with you, which he did because in her papers, are letters from Wells on Charlie Chaplin's personal stationery. I mean, it's it, it's just insane, really. And then, of course, Ernest. When she once she was with Ernest, uh, they met in December '36, um, and then we're in the Spanish Civil War in '37 and, and '38. You know, he brought his own um, group of celebrity friends, including Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman. Um, it's it just the way that it was, you know. Maybe this might be a good point to um, just read this little excerpt from a letter that Martha wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt. Is well, that okay? I, actually, well, I'm going to take myself off the screen because I want to. I want to listen to parts of of the reading as well. So I'm okay. going to disappear and well, ask if short. you could just if you could just select a couple of pieces and some of the letters that you might uh, might share with us. Okay, so that sounds good. So this is a letter that uh, uh, Martha wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt. It's dated January 8th, 1937 from Key West. And Martha was in Key West, December, 1936 with her mother and her younger brother, Alfred, because their father had died unexpectedly that January and they didn't wanna spend Christmas in St. Louis without him there. And so they met um, in Key West, Ernest Hemingway at Sloppy Joe's bar. That's how they met, this sort of happenstance meeting in Key West, December, 1936. And this is a letter that Martha wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, who she was close to, um, about that. I came down with mother and Alfred to escape a St. Louis Christmas. And they went back and I stayed on praying to my own gods. They both look like typewriters for some wisdom. I have thrown everything I've written out again. It is getting me blue as daisies, but there seems nothing else to do. Either this book must be just right and as alive as five minutes ago, or it won't be a book and I'll sit and nurse a lost year as best I can. I see Hemingway, who knows more about writing dialogue, I think, than anyone writing in English at this time. In a writer, this is an imagination. In anyone else, it's lying. That's where genius comes in. 
So I sit about and have just read the manuscript of his new book and been very smart about it. It's easy to know about other books, but such misery to know about one's own. And then a little later in the letter, as she's um, winding it up, and it just shows, this shows her how politically astute she was. If the madman Hitler really sends two divisions to Spain, my bet is that the war is nearer than even the pessimists thought. If there is a war, then all the things most of us do won't matter anymore. I have a feeling that one has to work all day and all night and live to and swim and get the sun in one's hair and laugh and love as many people as one can find around and do this all terribly fast because the time is getting shorter and shorter every day. I love you very much indeed, and I'm always glad to know you're alive. So to me, first of all, the intimacy with which she writes to Eleanor Roosevelt is, is extraordinary. Um, and that lasts their entire, entire life. Um, that they share together over, over 30 years. Now, not long after Martha wrote that letter to Eleanor Roosevelt in January, 1937, Martha received a letter from Ernest dated February 1st. And I think this is the first letter that he wrote to her. And what is extraordinary about this letter, um, uh, before I found it, nobody knew it existed. It was just stuck in a file of her papers in a folder that said letters from friends. And it was from the 1970s and, and 1980s. And here's this letter from 1937 uh, stuck in among them. So one of the exciting things about that is that there's something called the Hemingway Letters Project run by Cambridge University Press. And the woman who is the editor in chief of that, her name's Sandra Spanier. I didn't know this letter existed. And so because I found it, it's now going to be part of, of the Hemingway Letters Project. Anyway, I'll just read the, the opening paragraph here. This I couldn't get rights permissions to include this in the book because of the Hemingway Letters Project. They're, they're not allowing anybody to, to publish full-length letters from Ernest until that whole project is done, which probably won't be for another 10 or 12 years. So this is how it begins. Christ, Marty, I didn't know you were that good a writer. Had gone along in that Ruby story, and there you were, going along writing good sloppy writing with always enough truth in it so that if you keep throwing it, some of it will stick. And then you go and write as good or I guess better story than anybody ever wrote. Now I have to respect you as well as to be fond of you. Who is your master, Mr. Hemingstein? Miss Gellhorn, the author of Ruby. Listen, anybody that can write a story like that, if you don't work and learn your lousy trade now and have some respect for it, you are a bloody sin against the Holy Ghost. And thank you, Lucy, for putting this up on the screen. So you can see his, his signature there at the bottom, Hemingstein. It was a nickname, a self-appointed moniker for himself, and his closest friends would call him Hem or call him Hemingstein. Um, so that's that's pretty exciting. And for, imagine being Martha also and receiving this letter um, because it's about her writing. You know, Ernest, one of the things I discovered in all of this research is that that Hemingway really has received a bad rap from scholars um, about his lack of generosity of spirit and all of that, because as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's not even remotely true. The, the story that he's referring to is one that Martha wrote that's called Ruby, and it's in her book, The Trouble I've Seen, published in 1936. So he's read this. It was published that fall. He's read that book when they've met um, in December 1936, and it's a story about a child prostitute. 
And it's an amalgam of the child prostitutes that Martha met during all of her investigative uh, FIRA work. Uh, so just extraordinary on, on so many so many levels. Now I'm wondering, Lucy, if you wouldn't mind just um, going to the slide from Spain in 1937 that has the audio clip there. If you can put that up. Perfect. And this, so first of all, this is, you know, Martha and Ernest in Spain. On the picture on the right, I don't know if you can see on the logs there, there's a jacket. There's also a flask, a little silver flask. And that flask um, had engraved on it 2EH from EH. And I love that photo of Martha because her face is so open and natural. And that's Ernest uh, with his back to the camera, wearing a beret, just sitting at her feet. Um, I, I love everything about about that photo. When and both of them, they're on the front, in in Spain. And when you hear this clip, you'll hear um, what she describes about what she sees uh, on the front of that war, and it runs about ninety seconds. At the front trench, one of the soldiers said, look, there are some dead out there. And all Gellhorn could see were two dirty bundles of gray laundry, which may have been dead, but when they are dead, they are no longer men, only something finished and wasted and not good anymore. And you have to think about it to feel anything, even pity. The drive back was treacherous as the car plunged in and out of shell holes, and the road was naked and glaring with moon. Yet, when the chauffeur turned on the radio, and they drove lightless toward town with the radio blaring American jazz sung in Spanish, and the countryside like a dream, like an etching, and a bad negative, and too beautiful, Gellhorn was suddenly desperately and unbearably sad feeling of the way things pass before you can hold them, warm them, understand them, men and things, and of one's own phantom quality, of being without roots in a cyclone, and then the great aching sadness of not understanding, of not knowing at all why men live or die, or what this is about, or what the next thing will be about either. Thank you. Maybe, Risha, you'd like to come back onto the screen to... Um... I, I will. I will also, I'll open up the q and I, I, I loved hearing the reading of that. that. That was beautiful. So that is actually actress Ellen Barkin, who is the audiobook narrator. And she did such an amazing job of, of it and when I heard her recording for the first time it, it was like he, hearing those words Martha's words anew and my own words uh, anew she she made new meaning with her her performance of them so I wanted to include a clip so people could could hear what uh, remarkable thank you for that um some are, some of the um some of these are questions or some are comments so I will go through okay. them and ask and ask you to respond okay. if you would um this is fascinating and isn't it interesting that men are applauded and women ignored or completely silenced or at least some people try to silence the activities trying to silence uh, well first of all uh, it was impossible to silence Martha Gellhorn about anything, I would have to say. Um, you know, of course, there are double standards. There's still double standards in 2023, which is shocking. It's shocking, truly shocking. She'd be shocked by it, I, I think. Um, but you know, if you're a responsible citizen of the world, then you want to try to make it a better place for your fellow citizens. And um, one of the things that Martha was disappointed in about herself was that, that she 
never really, she knows she thought she never really did enough. She never went far enough uh, in some of the reporting that she did. Now, I, I don't think that's a, a fair assessment of, of her work, especially when you think of the shocking work she wrote about Dachau. Um, she was only there, she was there when the Americans liberated the camp and, and she was only there for two hours in May, 1945. And even 40 years later in a radio interview, she said of that time, it was as if I fell over a cliff and never recovered. That stayed with her the rest, rest of her long, long life. So, I don't know. Do you That's have a, um, a question? Yes. A question is, um, what in her childhood and early background and family development made her viewpoints? <laughs> well, I think part of it was because she was, was raised with three brothers. She was the second youngest. She had two older brothers and her younger brother, Alfred. Her younger, her younger brother, Alfred, was the one she was closest to. And so as, and as they aged, they became even closer. They were very good friends. They traveled together in their 80s. Uh, they went to Egypt in their 80s, that, that kind of thing. But also, as I mentioned, her mother was, was part of the League of Women Voters. Her father was an obstetrician gynecologist who also um, did a lot of volunteer work, treated a lot of poor patients, you know, um, who couldn't afford medical care. If they had a bushel of apples they could leave for the family, that's how they'd pay him. The children were expected to hold their own in conversation at the dinner table at a very young age. They were expected to read, to be citizens of the world, uh, to know what's going on in the world by reading newspapers. And uh, that was just something that they were expected to do. And you saw that picture of Martha as a little girl dragged along to one of her mother's uh, League of Women Voters marches. It was just part of her life, you know? And as I said earlier, she, it never occurred to her not to do what she wanted to do. She always wanted to, um, she said about writing, I, I want to go everywhere and see everything and sometimes write about it. And, and, and that's what she did her whole, her whole life. A question even, here. Even, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you finish. Please. Well, I wanted to say something about her when she was, you know, she was 88 when she filed her final piece of investigative reporting. She went to Salvador, Brazil, put on a knapsack, her running shoes, went to Salvador, Brazil, and reported on uh, the murdered street children of Salvador, Brazil. And nobody in the world was really paying any attention. It was, she saw it probably in the Guardian with three lines or something like that. And she decided she was going to go and see what was happening. And, and so she was 88 when she filed this, this piece of, about that. And I, I found that profoundly moving because really she began her writing career, writing about the treatment of the most disenfranchised people in the United States. Um, and she finished her career writing about the most disenfranchised uh, people in Brazil, you know, that never changed for her passion about that, um, never changed. She said, you know, I could, I could never help anyone, but I could remember for them. It was part of going on the record for her. She, um, it was really important for her to, to write the truth. And, and uh, you know, all of this swirling cacophony of lies and misinformation and half-truths and all of that in which we're saturated now, um, she, she'd be raging, raging about it. And she'd be, you know, writing letters to the editor, whether they print them or not, who knows, but she, she would not stop raging about the injustice of, of all of that. Question has come in. How did Martha get to know Eleanor Roosevelt? Well, she first met Eleanor Roosevelt. Martha, in 1929, after she left Bryn Mawr, um, 
went to Albany and she was a cub reporter for the Albany Times Union for a few months. And that's when Franklin was the governor of, of New York. And so the Roosevelt's were living in, in Albany. And because Martha's mother and Eleanor uh, knew each other through the League of Women Voters work, um, Martha's mother arranged for Martha to have dinner one night with the Roosevelt's at, at the governor's mansion. And so that's how they first met in, in 1929. But then she really got to know Eleanor um, after the work with, with Harry Hopkins. And as a result of that, and after being fired in 35, and then um, creating, you know, having this own, her own career as a war correspondent starting in 37, she continued to write to Eleanor about uh, the injustices she saw. So, um, about the treatment of the, of the Spanish Civil War refugees. There are letters that are like nine, 10 pages long that she sent that were really like reports that she sent to Eleanor Roosevelt and, and Eleanor would then tell Franklin about it. So, you know, Martha had influence in American foreign policy because of these, her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt and she and Eleanor remained friends the rest of, of uh, Eleanor's life. And when Martha remarried and was living in London in the late uh, 50s and early 60s, Eleanor would come and, and stay with Martha and, and her husband, Tom Matthews, or she'd come and have dinner with them one night because she was staying actually at Buckingham Palace with the Queen because Eleanor Roosevelt by that time was a, a world famous civil rights, human rights figure of her own standing. Right. And Martha missed just Mrs. Roosevelt, her friend, and and uh, would have have her come and stay with them. But it was a relationship that built over over 30 years. Right? And, and it never waned at all. And Martha said of Eleanor Roosevelt, she gave off light. I, I can't explain it any better. She gave off light. She was one of the finest people she'd ever known. And I think history shows that that's accurate about Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I love the framing of, of this comment. Um, Martha is my new answer to that question. If you could have anyone at your dinner table, who would it be? What a fascinating story, my kind of gal. Yeah, absolutely. She, um, she would be terrific company. And um, she loved to talk. Um, she was a lousy cook. She didn't really care much about food. So when microwaves were invented, you know, she was quite content to empty a can of tuna fish and a can of corn niblets and eat it up and you know eat that as her meal she did she honestly really didn't care but she loved to have people around to talk to argue uh, about what was happening in the world to see who she could enlist to causes that she was interested in um she was she had a lot of uh, very close male friends that never changed throughout her life i think you know having three brothers can, being considered one of them. All of her war correspondence work, uh, she just wanted to be one of the guys. And if you can see uh, at the cover of my book, sort of just over my shoulder there was Martha with the pilots in Puerto Rico, the US pilots in Puerto Rico. They're not even looking at her. I mean, she was, she was a good looking woman and she was just interested in the work and the experience. And, um, just, she just wanted to be one of the guys. And, and she really was just, just, and she was happiest just being one of the guys in pursuit of, of story. Did, yeah. um, did Gelhorn's work on injustice in the world pave the way for the next generation of women, of women to enter journalism? And if so, what was the impact? Well, you could even talk to Christiane Amanpour about this, but, um, most women war correspondents today will cite Martha in gratitude for the trailblazing work that she did in, in 30s and 40s, because if Martha hadn't existed, or Virginia Cowles, who was another one, who was a friend of hers, who she met in Spain, um, if those women hadn't existed, then uh, Marie Colvin wouldn't have existed, Lise Doucette, who works for the BBC, 
wouldn't have existed. Christian Amanpour wouldn't have existed. They they all owe a great debt to Martha Gellhorn, for sure. And they would all say so and have said have said so. I think the the next um, comment had to do with uh, Martha Gellhorn's. Um, cooking uh, habits. Some of us pay so much attention to our nutrition and here she is living to 89 on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and also she was a, she was a fiendish smoker. I mean, Oh, she, she smoked her whole life. Right. And she loved it. And at one point, Ernest uh, tried to get Martha to quit saying, you know, in solidarity with her, he'd stop drinking at all. In, uh, if she would stop smoking, well, that went nowhere because <laughs> she never stopped smoking. Yeah. Um, this question is, any evidence at all that Martha may have been a closeted homosexual? No evidence at all. Uh, no, I've, I've been asked that before. Absolutely not. Um, she wasn't really interested in a sex life. You know, she said in letters to friends about Ernest, her memory of sex with Ernest was, well, she just, it was unpleasant and she just hoped it would be over soon. Um, and her attitude towards that was in any of her relationships with men was it was something that, that men seemed to need and enjoy and she would just get on with it with as little fuss as possible. Yet there was one exception, and, and that is General James Gavin. Now, James Gavin, at 36, was the youngest general in the U.S. Armed Forces. He was in charge of the storied 82nd Airborne Division. And um, Martha had an affair with him in 46, the end of the war. And she, there's a huge stack of letters from, from Gavin in her papers probably more from him than any other man in her life. Um, hundreds of letters from James Gavin. He absolutely loved her. He wanted to marry her. He dumped Marlena Dietrich to be with Martha. He was dating Marlena Dietrich and then he dumped Marlena Dietrich to be with Martha. And um, she said of James Gavin, he was the only true physical passion of my life that ended really in boredom. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah. She, she also had an affair late in life with Lawrence Rockefeller for 30 years. They met when she was in her late 50s. And they'd see each other maybe once or twice a year. Um, but they had long conversations. And he was married. He was never going to leave his wife. Um, but she didn't care because she, she didn't want to be his wife herself. And um, he's one of the, the people who... Uh, came to her wake at her apartment in um, in London after she died. He and I've listened to a, a cassette tape of of that uh, that that's in her papers of all of the people who were there. And so he was one, and John Simpson, who still works for the BBC, was one, and uh, Nicholas Shakespeare, and Victoria Glendening and Martha's brother, Alfred, and her stepson, Sandy Matthews, and her adopted son, Sandy Gellhorn. Um, they were all there and everybody came to her flat in Cadogan Square and they drank famous grouse scotch whiskey, which was her favorite tipple, and told stories about Martha. And um, really, really wonderful stories about, about Martha and how much she meant in their lives, so. Can't wait not, to read, oh, sorry. Sorry, not a lesbian, definitely <laughs> not a lesbian is the answer to that question. Can't wait to read your book and learn more about Martha. So glad you wrote the book. You said deciding what to leave out was a challenge for you. Yeah. Um, what type of revisions did you have to do to ensure your book was as compelling as Martha? That's a really good question. Well, once I decided how to frame it and that I was going to end it where I ended it with her adoption of, of Sandy in 1949, then everything from, from that point on till her death in, in 98, I, I didn't really use. So the publisher did ask me to write a little afterward, which is included in the book and, and tells you a little bit about her, her friendship, the friendships from 1950 forward. But the book itself was probably 
I'm going to say 100,000 words longer than the book that you have in your hands, Risha. And the first cut um, was any time there was any kind of overlap in content wise in letters. And so then I decided, okay, so who, uh, which uh, correspondent is most compelling? And so that's the, that's the letter that states. So that was the first cut. So I, let's say I could cut 40,000 words just by, by doing that. And then um, when I figured out how I was going to uh, connect um, the narrative, because I, the letters were organized in a way that there is an organic narrative to the correspondence themselves. Um, I also went through to see if there was anybody, it may have been interesting to me, but would it be interesting to a stranger? So if it's that, if I didn't think it would be interesting to a stranger, if it was just something I was keeping because I was interested, then, then I, also, I also made the cut. And so I was able to cut it down um, that, that way. But um, there's still so much more to write about Martha. Still much, I mean, there's, she had, I mean, her, she had all those, uh, famous friends up until the end of the 1940s, but then she also was friends with Leonard Bernstein, you know, <laughs> and Rebecca West and Sybil Bedford. And these might not be names that people are familiar with, but these were um, people famous in, in their time who were all part of Martha's um, inner circle. So, yeah. One of the interesting things for me, too, about writing this book is how uh, the connections that I've made uh, out, out in the world with people, and I, I, I would be remiss to not mention Margaret Atwood, because as some of you probably know, she has a new book of short stories out called Old Babes in the Wood, and there's a story in there about Martha Gellhorn, and Martha, um, Martha knew Margaret Atwood's father-in-law, the Brigadier General, Thomas Graham Gibson. And she wrote a letter to him. And so Margaret Atwood actually reached out to me and said, I have this letter. For, this is after my book was, was pub published. And she said, I have this letter. I don't think you know about it because it's not in your book. And <laughs> would you like a copy? So, so she sent me a copy. And um, I put her in touch with Sandy Matthews, Martha's steps on an executor, so she could get permission to use it in her story. And the story is called A Dusty Lunch, and it's set in Italy in 1944. And um, Martha is, uh, is the main character of that story. So if you're reading the new Margaret Atwood stories, Old Babes in the Wood, A Dusty Lunch is there featuring Martha Gellhorn. And um, she had me fact check it. So she made, I, she made changes based on on my suggestions to that. So that's kind of fun. And um, I also got the opportunity to speak with Patrick Hemingway, who is Ernest's only surviving son. He had um, a book of letters out of, with his father called Dear Papa that came out last year at about this time. And uh, I spoke with him for two hours by phone at his, at his home in Montana. Never thought I'd get a chance to speak with him. And, and so we talked about Martha too. and. Um, he, we laughed a lot because I know enough about his childhood in, in her company in New York City and, and also in Cuba that I could ask him questions that, that would interest, um, interest him. But I never thought I'd ever get a chance to talk to Patrick Hemingway, um, who Martha adored. And, and, and there are letters um, to Ernest's sons in Martha's papers long after she and she and Ernest divorced in December 45. She remained friends with those boys for the rest for the rest of her life. And they considered her, they loved her and respected her. And if they were ever in any kind of trouble or wanted any advice about the, the estate, um, they always consulted her uh, about that. So that's pretty fun too. Um, next comment and question is, I'm so glad that you published this book on Martha Gellhorn. More women and their contributions in the war and humanity need to be researched, published, and discussed. Thank you so much for your interest in her, as well as your devotion to uncover her life. You have widened my love of reading books, with three exclamation marks after That's that. That's so lovely. And there's some other really great um, books about women war correspondence. There's, a, there's um, one by Judith 
Mackerel, M-A-C-K-R-E-L-L. She's also a dance critic, but um, she wrote about six women war correspondents um, fairly recently, including Virginia Callows and Martha, and uh, the other names have just dropped out of my head, but there are more books coming out about, about these women um, now, and I'm really glad that there's more of an interest in, in the pioneering work that they, that they, they did. They, they were all really extraordinary. I mean, Martha was singular for sure, but they were all extraordinary. Well, here's a good question. Have you had movie TV deals interested in your book? <laughs> oh, well, early on there was, and then it just went nowhere. Um, and I actually happened to be, my, my nephew is um, a screenwriter and um, we're actually, we've actually written a pilot for a limited series and we've actually sketched out uh, the limited series. So we've only written the pilot so far. And that's been fun at figuring out a, a, a visual way to to represent these years of Martha's Martha's life. Well, well, based on that question, um, I'm going to ask you back. Do you have anybody in mind who would play Martha? Sure. Um, either Michelle Williams or Charlie's Theron. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? If we will, I'll just pause for a moment, see if anybody has a final question that they would like to put in the Q&A before I close off this evening. Going, going. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of our evening and I wanna thank Janet Somerville for sharing her fascinating book with us. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, I'd like to thank Melissa Zilberberg, who's the Director of Publicity at Firefly Press. She has been such a support in getting this evening underway. I don't know if she's on, but but somebody will tell her thank you from me. I'd like to thank Lucy Frechette for tech support and to our guests for spending your evening with us. Yours for Probably Always is available for loan at Aurora Public Library. Of course, it's also available in bookstores. The pictures are so beautiful, you might actually want to own it rather than return it to the library. So read it with us first and then buy yourself a copy so you can have it forever. Um, and I'd like to say good night to everybody, to our guests, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Risha. It's been, it's really fun. And thank you, Lucy, for the tech support essential. Bye, everyone.